sleep is critical to our health. Sleep is the foundation of mental health, physical health, and performance of all kinds. It also controls things like our immune system, our skin health, and our appearance. Basically, everything in life gets better when we're sleeping well. So you may ask, what are the things that you can do that are really going to set you up for the best possible sleep later that night? This is a practical toolkit that anyone, indeed all people I believe, should use in order to optimize their sleep. First of all, be careful about ingesting too much caffeine throughout the middle of the day. That's kind of an obvious one. Certainly avoid drinking more than 100 milligrams of caffeine after 4 p.m. And probably even better to limit your last caffeine intake to 3 p.m. or even 2 p.m. And I say this knowing that many people, including myself, can drink a double espresso with 200 milligrams of caffeine or more at 5 p.m. or even 6 p.m. or after dinner and still, quote unquote, fall asleep fine or still sleep fine. However, there are terrific data Matt Walker and I talked about this and there are more and more papers all the time that point to the fact that caffeine intake late in the day after 4 p.m. that is can really disrupt the architecture of your sleep. So you might think you're sleeping well, but you're not sleeping nearly as well as you could if you avoided caffeine in those afternoon hours. Second of all, if you are a napper, and I raise my hand now, for those of you listening, I'm raising my right hand because I love naps. I've always loved naps. Should you nap? Should you not nap? That's a question that I get asked a lot and that I asked Dr. Matthew Walker when he was a guest on this podcast. Here was his answer and here's what the data support. It is fine to nap in the afternoon, but don't nap so late in the day or for so long that it disrupts your ability to fall and stay asleep at night for your major sleep bout. For those of you that exercise in the afternoon, understand that if you exercise very intensely, so this might be weight training or running or some other very intense exercise, typically that's going to further increase your body temperature and it's going to so-called delay your circadian clock. It's going to make it such that you want to fall asleep a little bit later, maybe even a lot later. So if you're exercising in the afternoon or evening and that's the only time you can exercise or that's the time that you prefer to exercise, great. But be careful about ingesting too much caffeine in order to get the energy to do that exercise because that caffeine will disrupt your sleep and just know that you are delaying your circadian clock. You are making it such that you will naturally want to go to sleep later and wake up later. Contrast that with if you exercise early in the day, immediately after waking up or in the first four hours after waking. In most cases, that's not going to shift your circadian clock much. So should you be looking at sunlight or bright artificial lights throughout the day? Now, on the face of it, you might just think, yes, you know, sunlight's great. Provided we're not getting a sunburn and we're not staring at the sun and damaging our eyes, we should get as much sunlight as we possibly can. So sunlight to the eyes, sunlight in the late afternoon and evening hours. So again, depends on time of year, depends on location that you happen to be in. But getting some sunlight in your eyes for, again, maybe five or 10, maybe 30 minutes, depending on how much cloud cover there is, doing that in the afternoon serves an additional beneficial purpose, which is you protect or you inoculate your nervous system against some of the negative effects of bright artificial light or even dim artificial light in the nighttime hours between 10 p.m. and 4 a.m. You're going to want to avoid bright artificial lights of any color. In the evening hours and nighttime hours, it takes very little light, very few photons in order to wake up your brain and body and to disrupt your circadian clock and disrupt your sleep. So what that means is that once the sun goes down, which of course is going to happen at different times of year in different places on earth, but once the sun goes down, you would be wise to try and dim the lights in your indoor environment most days, right? I realize some nights you're going to throw a party and have people over. You might not want to dim the lights. Some nights you're going to go out. You might view a lot of bright lights, but most nights of your life, you're going to want to dim the lights in your internal environment. And ideally the lights that you do use, you would place low in that physical environment. So you would try and not use overhead lights, but rather rely on desk lamps or lights even placed low to the floor, even on the floor. The absolute worst lights are going to be overhead fluorescent lights of the sort that you would uh, have in the supermarket or uh, that you would see at a gas station or something of that sort. And I confess there are times in which I'm, you know, driving home and it's late at night and I want to be able to get to sleep and I'll need to stop at the grocery store or a gas station or something like that. I've actually put on sunglasses at night in order to avoid getting that bright light exposure at night, although that's a little bit extreme. Uh, I have done that from time to time because that bright light exposure will absolutely quash. It will eliminate any melatonin that happens to be circulating in your brain and body. Now, melatonin, a lot of people think of as a supplement, but melatonin is naturally released 
as the evening comes about and into the nighttime hours, it's the hormone that makes you feel sleepy and allows you to fall asleep. So viewing bright light in the late evening hours and nighttime hours is really not good for your sleep quality and your ability to fall and stay asleep. So for most people, a simple rule of thumb is going to be avoid bright artificial lights of all colors and in particular overhead bright artificial lights between the hours of 10 p.m. and 4 a.m. You should try and make your sleeping environment pretty cool, if not cold. Now, that doesn't mean you need to be cold while you're asleep. You can get under as many blankets as you need, but it's a good idea to make your sleeping environment cool. In fact, drop the temperature in that sleeping environment by at least three degrees, and you'll be happy that you did because of the relationship between temperature and sleep. That is, dropping your core body temperature one to three degrees gets you into sleep and helps you stay asleep. I would be remiss if I didn't touch on alcohol and CBD and THC because the sleep that one gets after drinking alcohol is greatly disrupted sleep. Hate to break it to you, but that's the truth. And when Dr. Matt Walker came on this podcast, he said exactly the same thing. While THC and alcohol do help some people fall asleep and maybe even stay asleep, the architecture of that sleep is suboptimal compared to the sleep they would get without alcohol or THC in their system. Now, very briefly, I just want to touch on some tools that are very commonly used by many people out there. And believe it or not, there is peer-reviewed science on things like eye masks. Do eye masks improve your ability to stay asleep? And indeed, they do, provided they are not too tight and provided that the room is cool enough. Why? Well, eye masks cover the upper half of your face, which is where glabrous skin is localized. Remember, palms of the hands, bottoms of the feet, glabrous skin on the face. So a lot of people who wear eye masks will wake up because they're too warm if the room is too warm. So if you're going to use an eye mask to keep light out, definitely make sure the room and your sleeping environment and your bed are cool enough in order for you to stay asleep. Other tools that I'll just mention that have peer-reviewed research to support them, elevating your feet either with a pillow or by elevating the end of your bed by about three to five degrees can be really beneficial for increasing the depth of sleep because of the so-called glymphatic washout. This is the movement of and circulation of fluids in your brain at night that lead to more wakefulness and actually can improve cognitive function and a number of other things related to brain health. There's one caveat to that for people that suffer from acid reflux, having your ankles elevated above your chest or above your heart in the middle of the night can actually exacerbate that acid reflux. You want to do the opposite. You want to actually elevate your the head side of your bed by about three to five degrees. I do want to mention a couple of broad contour tools that will impact your ability to sleep really well on a consistent basis. And the one that impacts the most number of people is weekends. Turns out that most everybody feels the impulse to sleep in on the weekend, especially if they've been out late the night before. However, the data show that keeping relatively consistent sleep and wake times is really going to enhance the quality and depth of your sleep. So if you stay out late one night, sure, you might allow yourself to sleep in an extra hour or so, but you should really try to avoid sleeping in longer than an hour beyond your normal wake up time. That's right. If you normally get eight hours of sleep and you wake up at 7 a.m., probably okay to wake up at 8 a.m. on the weekend or after a night out the night before, but try not to sleep until 11 or noon thinking that you're going to catch up on your sleep or that's better than waking up at a consistent time. It would be better to wake up at a consistent time, plus or minus an hour, and get a nap in the afternoon provided that nap, again, isn't too long. If, for instance, you're somebody who falls asleep just fine, but wakes up in the middle of the night, there are two categories of supplements that you might want to consider. The first is myo-inositol, typically taken as 900 milligrams of myo-inositol. Myo-inositol can help shorten the amount of time that it takes to fall back asleep if you wake up in the middle of the night. Other people who wake up in the middle of the night will wake up because their dreams are very intense or they were having dreams that were so vivid that suddenly they were jolted from their dreams. Those people would do well to avoid certain supplements. So in a moment, I'll talk about the value of a supplement called theanine for falling asleep. But theanine, which typically is taken in dosages anywhere from 100 milligrams to 400 milligrams, depending on body weight and experience and what you find to be most effective for you, minimally effective for you, 
Well, theanine can be great for many people, but for people who have excessively vivid dreams, those excessively vivid dreams can lead to immediate waking and sometimes a little bit of anxiety upon waking in the middle of the night. So some people who wake up in the middle of the night so sort of jolted mentally and physically out of sleep because of their intense dreams would do well to avoid theanine supplementation. Now, for those of you that are not waking up in the middle of the night or not having excessively vivid dreams, but are having trouble falling asleep, two supplements in particular have been shown to be effective for shortening the transition time to sleep and allowing people to ease into sleep more readily. And those are magnesium threonate, which is interchangeable with magnesium bisglycinate. Magnesium bisglycinate and magnesium threonate both have transporter systems that allow them to readily cross the blood-brain barrier, and they lead to a mild form of drowsiness, mild in the sense that it's not going to prevent you from operating a motor vehicle or you'd still be able to function, so it's not like a sleeping pill. But people who take those often find that their transition time into sleep is much faster and their sleep is also much deeper. And then the other supplement is apigenin, A-P-I-G-E-N-I-N, apigenin, which is a derivative of chamomile. It also acts as a bit of a anxiety lowering compound, which is essential prior to sleep for people to essentially turn off their thinking or to be able to reduce the amount of ruminating and problem solving and future anticipation that they're doing, which is a requirement for falling asleep. So what's the rational approach to supplementing in a way that allows you to fall asleep more quickly and stay asleep? Well, would you immediately take magnesium threonate and apigenin together? Well, that depends. If you have the budget and you just simply want to fall asleep quicker and you don't care which of those two ingredients is going to be more effective, effective for you, well, then you could try one, for instance, magnesium threonate and try it for perhaps a week and see how that affects your latency to sleep time. That is how quickly you fall asleep. Or you could try apigenin in the first week, or you could co combine them both, or you could try magnesium threonate for a week, then switch to only apigenin for a week and evaluate which one works better for you. If neither works for you, I do recommend trying the combination together. Again, this is just the way that any scientist would design an experiment to try and understand which variables, that is, which ingredients are most effective for the result that you want, as opposed to just lumping them together and taking them. 